chilly, but that's okay. It's warm in here. There are a few announcements. There is no Bible study this week because it's the day before Thanksgiving. Uh, Saturday the 3rd, we are decorating the church. That's at 9.30. The uh, consistory meeting is a week early on, in December. It's going to be on the 5th, so make note of that. The deacons and elders meetings will be at 6, and the general consistory at 7. Uh, there is a congregational meeting right after the service on, November, on December 11th. And on the 18th, we are going Christmas caroling with pizza and Coke uh, and hot chocolate afterwards. Jean, would you like to bring us up to date on what we did at the sale yesterday? Um, I want to thank everybody who helped out and participated in our Holly Berry annual sale. Um, just wanted to announce the frozen apple pie cake and bake sale is over. Um, thank you everybody who bought pies. Um, our grand total, including our pie sale, bake sale, and the Holly Berry, um, $2,105.
at confirmation tests this morning, at the end of a long, tortuous, three-year confirmation class that was interrupted by COVID. And Bella and Carly both passed with flying colors. And I can't wait to show the elders their, their tests. So good job, ladies. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 111. The works of his hands are faithful and just, and all of his precepts are trustworthy. Please open to our sentences from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, and though the mountains tremble with its tumult, see why. There is a river God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people. It is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he shall be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Please stand if you're able for our opening hymn number two, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
words of greeting from Colossians 1. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from His glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully he has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the end, the firstborn from the dead, so that none may come into the first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether or not. Touch 
unnecessarily. Lord, we pray for your healing power to flow through her right now from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet. Father, we pray that you would cause every tissue in this joint to function the way you designed and intended it to when you knit her together at her mother's womb. We pray, Lord, that you would take this pain from her, that you would take the source of this pain, the cause of this pain from her. And we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen her and bless her in Jesus' name. Sometimes the good stuff is what happens in between the lines. Anyone else? Oh. Uh, as always, our servicemen and women, uh, our first responders, particularly those in LA. Uh, yeah. Busy. Difficult week. Yes. Uh, medical people. Uh, Michelle's family, holiday coming up. Yes. Deb? Yeah, and I'll add Patty's, the, the highway department, because of all the snow that's coming and the mess and everything that is going to come along with it um, for their safety. But uh, I also have a young friend um, who lost her mom last year. And this year, she's in the hospital with her stepfather as he approaches his final days. Um, so prayers for Shannon and for Don that his passing um, into the Lord is painless. For Shannon and for Don. So that's, yeah, losing a loved one is always hard. Losing a loved one around the holidays is even harder. We'll be praying for them. Judy. smoothly and well, they get it together and get things moving for you. Yes, Jim. Father, for 
for Shannon, we pray that you would touch her, that your peace that passes all understanding would surround both her and Don right now. Father, we pray that you would hold them in your hands and that you would draw him to your arms. Father, we thank you that we can walk with you when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. For all of those who are grieving right now and who have lost loved ones, we thank you, Lord, that we don't have to do this alone, but that you walk with us. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless them and that you would bring them through that valley and into the light of your Son again. Father, we thank you that you are with us, whether we're facing big problems or small problems. We pray, Lord, that you would... Father, we pray that you touch Emily right now. We pray, Lord, for healing, for strengthening in her heart, that it would pump the way it is supposed to. We pray, Lord, for Deb, that you would cause these kidney stones to be broken up and dissolved and gone from her system, that she would not need to go for a procedure, since that seems to be such a problem. We pray, Lord, that you would take this from her, that she could have relief from this pain, and sooner rather than later. We thank you, Lord, that you are with her even right now. Father, we pray for Bill as he goes to meet with the radiologist, that you would guide the doctor, that you would give him wisdom, that you would just take charge of everything in this situation, that the treatment plan would be right, that everything that needs to be done would be done smoothly and well and done right the first time. And we pray, Lord, that you would cause this treatment to be effective and without side effects. Lord, we pray for all of those who serve, whether it be in the military or the mission field or here at home, our first responders, our medical personnel, and yes, those who keep the roads open for us as well. All of those in the travel industry right now, the, the airports are about to hit a peak as well. Lord, we pray that you would be with them and that you would help them to do the jobs well, that you would keep them safe. Father, we pray for the people who were injured in Los Angeles, that you would be with them and watch over them. We pray, Lord, for healing in each and every case. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the good things, Lord. We thank you for the, for the milestones for Sue and Tom in 50 years. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless them, continue to hold them close to you and close to each other that you would continue to meet every need that they have, Lord, and provide for them. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father, for, for blooms, even in the cold weather, that remind us that life goes on, to remind us that life in you goes on. And Father, we pray that as we prepare to enter the holiday season this year, that we would not get swept away by the noise and the chaos, but that we would walk in the wonder of your works, of the things that you've done, of everything that you've given us. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Let's pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Our second hymn is number 446. I will serve thee.
seated, we come now to the offering of our lives. beach and there were a whole 
bunch of baby turtles that were trying to get across the beach and into the water because they had just hatched out of eggs. And he was picking them up and throwing them into the water because the seagulls were coming down to try and eat the baby turtle before they could get to the water. And there were just so many of them, and there were so many birds. And somebody said to him, what are you doing? You can't possibly make a difference. And he picked the baby turtle up and threw it into the water and said, well, I made a difference to that one. Now, we can't solve all the problems in the world, but we might be able to solve a problem for one person and change their whole world. How about that? Okay. Chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 is a long chapter, as evidenced by the fact that we're going to be reading verses in the 60s and 70s. But you're not going to miss anything, because I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of what went on before we started reading after we finish reading. So we'll begin, I know it says we're going to begin with verse 68, I'm going to begin with verse 67, just to give a little context. His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. This is the word of the Lord. And may the Lord add his blessing to his word. Father, as we turn now from your word, divine and inspired, to the words that I believe you've given me, I pray you guide everything that's said and everything that's heard, that what is from you would be sealed in our hearts. In Jesus' name. Well, to give you a little bit of background on this, Zechariah is a priest. Zechariah is serving in the temple. It was his turn to go into the temple and to burn incense on the altar to worship God. At the end of this period of burning incense, while all of the people were gathered outside the temple praying, it would be customary for Zechariah to then come outside and offer a benediction. But this time things were different. Because when Zechariah went in to burn the incense and to worship God, God showed up. Have you ever had that experience of worshiping God and suddenly God shows up? Maybe not in the way you were expecting. I'll tell you what, it's a good day when that happens. Well, in Zechariah's case, God sent an angel with a message. The same angel who had gone to Zechariah's wife Elizabeth's cousin, a girl named Mary, 
just a few verses before that, and told her, hey, God's got big plans and you're right in the middle of them. He now comes to Zechariah and tells him, God's got big plans and you're a part of it too. In both cases, he was bringing a birth announcement. To Mary, he said that there was going to be a virgin birth and that God himself was coming into the world. To Zechariah, he said that there was going to be a miraculous birth to, of a baby to a couple who were both past the age of childbearing and that they were going to see their son become a prophet who would go before the face of the Lord. The one who would lead the way, pave the road for Jesus. That, of course, would be John the Baptist. Interesting that he should be named John. When he was born, and they asked Elizabeth what he was going to be called, Elizabeth said he would be named John, and they said, why? Nobody in your family is named John. But that was the name that the angel Gabriel had told Zechariah to give him. John means Yahweh, God, has been gracious. Now, the reason Elizabeth was the one they asked what the child should be named was because Zechariah couldn't speak. See, when Gabriel met Zechariah in the temple as he was burning insults, incense and told him what was going on, Zechariah couldn't grasp it. He couldn't make himself believe it. And so, as a result, Gabriel told him, you're going to be unable to speak until the child is born. Now you have a choice. You can either accept the fact that this is going to happen, that God is going to bring this to pass, or you can accept the fact that you're never going to utter another word for the rest of your life. Zechariah was a little late in believing, but he came to believe. If we go back to Genesis, we remember Abraham was told when he and Sarah were well past the age of childbearing, that they were going to have a son. And it says that Abraham believed. And because he believed, God considered him righteous. Abraham believed before it happened. Zechariah believed, but he believed afterwards. But God still had grace on him. Now the benediction is the prayer of blessing at the end of the service. You see me offer it every week. There's one service out of the year that I don't end with a benediction, and that's Monday Thursday. That's the service where we remember Jesus being arrested, betrayed, and taken to his death. At the end of that service, there is no benediction because we're not done. We don't end there. The story does not end with the crucifixion. The next couple of days, until we get to Sunday morning, it's like we've taken the jump, but we're waiting to hit the water. And when we come in here on Easter morning, man, what a splash. We've been waiting for it, and here it is. Now, Christ is risen. Well, this benediction waited a lot longer than three days. Zechariah, when he came out of the temple, was unable to speak. So there was no benediction given to the people that day. But what he had inside of him had nine months to ruminate and to grow 
and to mature. He had nine months to dwell on what the angel had said to him and what it would mean. He had nine months during which he saw the miraculous happen. That even though it should not have been possible, his wife was pregnant. And then their son was born. And at that time, Zechariah's mouth was opened. And everything that had been building up in him all of that time came pouring out. That benediction plus interest comes pouring out of him. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He talks about God raising up a horn of salvation. Horns are very, very symbolic, very important. You know, we come into the celebration of Thanksgiving, a lot of people among the decorations they put up is the horn of plenty with all of the food piled up in it. A provision. But in the Bible, horns mean much more than that. The horn is a symbol of strength. When Joshua led the Israelites to Jericho, they marched around the city once a day for six days. On the seventh day, they marched around the city seven times. And then what happened? The priests blew their horns. And then the people gave a shout and the walls came down. The horn was a symbol of God's strength. How about when it came time to start choosing kings? With Saul, with David, with everyone after that, what did they do? They took a horn of oil and anointed them to become king. Stop and think about that for a second. Big old ram's horn. How much oil can you fit in one of those? When I take a little dab of this on the end of my finger and make the sign of the cross on your forehead, that's a whole lot better than having somebody take a ram's horn full of oil and just glug, 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 glug. Yeah. The horn is a symbol of God's presence, of his anointing. You will be able to do whatever I call you to do because I will be with you. I will be all over you. I will be covering you from head to toe. When Moses' brother Aaron was anointed as the first high priest, it says that they poured the oil over his head and it ran down his beard and ran off onto his clothes. Ever since then, whenever somebody tells me, I'm going to go run an errand, I ask, are you going to pour oil down his beard? Unless they're an Old Testament reader, they don't know what I'm talking about. That brings us to another interesting part in here. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. about John the Baptist at this point. Zechariah is not prophesying about his son when he makes that reference. Zechariah is a priest, which means he is from the tribe of Levi and from the house of Aaron. The house of David was in the tribe of Judah. The house of David is the lineage that Jesus comes from. So Zechariah is saying that the horn of salvation that God will raise up will be Jesus. Now this is before he has any way of knowing anything about Jesus. This is the Holy Spirit talking. He will show mercy to our ancestors and remember his holy covenant. 
How about that? He will show mercy to our ancestors. Yeah. All of those Old Testament saints, Abraham, David, Daniel, all of those guys, they were saved by the same faith that you were saved by. They were saved by the faith of believing God's promise that the Messiah was going to come and was going to die for their sins. The same faith that we have, the same Messiah that we believe in, only they believed in it before it happened, whereas we're believing in it after it's happened. But God's promise is good, whichever side you're on. So, the house of David. And then he says, and you, my child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. Now he's back to talking about John. You will be called the prophet of the Most High, and you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. That's exactly what John would do. John the Baptist would be the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, and the people would come to him to be baptized and to repent from their sins, to turn away from their sins. That's what repentance means, to turn away from their sins and to prepare their hearts for the coming of Messiah. And some people came to John and said, Are you the Messiah? Who are you? What are you doing? And he said to them, I'm the voice of one shouting in the wilderness to prepare the way for the Lord. There's one coming after me who I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. And then along came Jesus. John became a prophet of the Most High. The last of the Old Testament prophets, even though he's in the New Testament. Because he was the last before Jesus did his work. To testify that God was sending Jesus to do his work. The prophets all the way back Isaiah, Jeremiah, all of these guys gave knowledge of God's salvation to the people. They let everybody know this is what God is doing. And that's what John did. Zechariah goes on to talk about the rising sun coming to us from heaven. The rising sun, not just meaning the sun coming up on the east, but the Son of God coming up in our midst. The dawn, not only of a new day, but of a new covenant. That transition from Old Testament to New Testament. That point from when we go from believing in what God is going to do because he's going to do it, to believing in what God has done because he has done it. This is the moment in history that they're arriving at. I love the fact that Zechariah wraps this up with a throwback. To shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the path of peace. There is a loud echo of the 23rd Psalm right there. To shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. And then he goes on, the end of the psalm to say lead us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake actually that was before but either way guide our feet in the path of peace path of peace path of righteousness what is righteousness doing the right thing doing what you know you're supposed to be doing. When do you have God's peace, the most 
powerfully palpable in your life when you know you're doing what he wants you to be doing. The wind can be blowing out there like it sounds like it's going to bring the building down and the trees on top of us. And you know what? I am at perfect peace because I know that I am exactly where God wants me to be. I hope you are too. The way of peace is the path of righteousness. If we're walking in the path of righteousness, we're walking in peace. No matter what the bumps in the road are. All of this has been stewing in Zechariah from the moment that he was told that John would be born. Bubbling up, building up, waiting for the moment that it could all burst out. And here it is. His song of praise to Yahweh pours forth. Yahweh has been gracious. John was well named. As we get ready for the celebration of the Advent season, as we get ready for the time when we remember the coming of Christ into the world, let's remember to walk in paths of righteousness, to do the right thing, to do what we know he's called us to do. If we're walking in his righteousness, we'll be walking in his peace. And if we're walking in his peace, the shadow of death has no fear. Because he is with us. <laughs> Amen. If you thought it was easy finding hymn number two, you're going to really love the last one.
burdens before you and give you peace. Amen.